see revival. Revival does not happen by accident. There is a part that the preacher has, and I understand that. There is also a part that you, the listeners, have. Experience is a very poor guide. I wouldn't base major life decisions off experience. However, experience does teach us things to a given extent. And we have been privileged to be in many churches, and I would hope we've learned some things along the way. I think we have. Um, and I think a lot of times people get into a, maybe a mindset, a mentality, I don't know how you may refer to it, about revival. Oh, it's revival week, and um, you know I, I've been in revival services before, so you just kind of go through the motions. But here's, here's what we need. We don't need just another week of revival services. You following my thinking on that? What we need is a Holy Spirit-empowered, life-changing week of meetings where when it is all said and done, God has worked in our life. I'll ask you a personal question. Don't be offended by it. It's not intended to be offensive. But do you, do you need revival in your life? Sure, I think all of us do. Um, and the, the, like the Bible says, I think in Romans 13, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Look, there, there, there's no better time than now. This, this is when we need God to work in our life. Um, but what happens sometimes is this. We become set in our ways. You ever been guilty of that? <laughs> you know, we, we live in Tennessee and um, good old country folks there in Tennessee. And it's kind of this, this attitude. Well, preacher, we just ain't ever done it that way before. <laughs> you know, it's just a, we're used to doing things a certain way. And we can become bent in our thinking. We can become set in our ways. And, you know, there's a great danger to becoming set in your ways. There's a great danger to becoming bent in your thinking, to think it can be one way and one way only. Let me ask you a question that will kind of set the stage for an, uh, another passage we're going to look at here in just a minute. Do you think the blessings of God have ever passed you by because you've been set in your ways? Maybe it's speculating, but... Surely it's happened. I know it has to have happened with me. And um, I don't want to think too long about it. But, uh, you know, we become so set in our ways about something. I want to show you an example in the Bible of a group of people who were so set in their ways that they would miss out on God's best for their life. Turn to Mark chapter number 2, but don't, don't lose Timothy because I told you that'd be a springboard. We're going to come back to it. Turn over to the book of Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> And notice with me a group of people who were set in their ways, bent in their thinking, if you will. Mark chapter 2, and in just a moment, we'll just pick it up with verse number 1. Mark 2, looking, beginning with verse number 1. In Mark chapter 2, you have recorded just a typical day, if we could say it that way, in the life of the Lord Jesus. N nothing we are going to read here will take you by surprise. If there were a typical day that the Lord would go through, Mark chapter 2 probably unfolds it for us. So follow along as we read. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch, there, there were, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. So the Lord came to a town, multitudes of people gathered together. Was that unusual? No, it, it happened often, okay. And... Uh, and there was not so much as about the door. There was, there was, it was standing room only. Notice what the Lord does. And he preached the word unto them. I've always been interested in this. The Lord Jesus could do no better than preach the word of God to groups of people when they gathered together. We live in the Nashville, Tennessee area, about 40 miles south of Nashville. And it really is kind of the... Uh, the, 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 the Southern Baptist Convention is headquartered in the Nashville, Tennessee area, and it's a, a big mega church, new evangelical church. They, they all thrive there. And a lot of times they send out mailings, and we've occasionally gotten those in the mail. They're kind of humorous. And uh, for a while there, it was the top 10 reasons why you should come to our church. It's pretty neat. I don't know if you ever get anything like that uh, in the mail around here, but top 10 reasons you should come to our church. And uh, the number one reason on one of them was this, don't worry, we won't preach to you. 
That's the number one reason why you should come to our church. Don't worry, it said, we won't preach to you. Well, I think preaching is important. You want to know why? Because that's what the Lord Jesus did. It's not because of the preacher, by the way. Any preacher who thinks that needs to remember it's through the foolishness of preaching, okay? So, so much for the guy who thinks he's arrived. But nonetheless, when multitudes of people gathered together, what did the Lord Jesus do? He preached the word unto them. And I think that's what we should model in our ministries, the preaching of the word of God. Look at verse 3. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. So you have these four individuals who bring their friend to the Lord Jesus because physically he could not get there by himself. He, he was um, incapable. He was not able to walk. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. Quite an effort these men gave to getting their friend to the Lord Jesus. Now, have you wondered why they brought him to Jesus? Someone says, well, it's because he needed to be healed physically. That's not the reason they brought their friend to the Lord Jesus. The Bible tells you that very plainly in the next verse. Verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So the verse teaches us that Jesus knew why they had come. He saw their faith, and he said to the one who was sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. This is just fascinating. We could park here the whole service. It appears that the four other fellows were probably saved, okay, because Jesus knew their faith. He knew why they had come. And they had come because their friend, who was physically incapable of coming to the Lord Jesus, needed to be saved. And the Lord knew that. So he said, son, thy sins be forgiven. The great effort that they gave to getting people to the Lord Jesus. Now, we could be crooked with this, but I'm not going to be okay. But you have to, to a certain amount, go, what am I doing to get people to the Lord Jesus? Does that mean you got to uncover the roof next week? No, that's not what it means, okay? Um, but it means there's effort that's required on the part of people when it comes to getting other people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what the friends did. And Jesus said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, let me ask you a question. It's not a hard question. It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to trick you, okay? How many of you believe his sins were forgiven? If you believe that, will you raise your hand? Okay, let me make, see. Very good. Very good, class. You get 100 today, all right? So far, so good. His sins were forgiven. Now, um, was there any outward visible sign of that? No. Um, I'm being a little facetious. This is tongue in cheek, okay? Have you ever heard testimonies like this? I assume they're true. I, I, I don't question them. They, they, they make me a little nervous sometimes. But have you ever heard something like this? I'm telling you, brother, sister, when I got saved... The birds just sang a little bit louder. Amen? You could just tell when I was saved, the stars just shined a little bit brighter. Amen? Well, what about the poor guy who was saved in the dead of winter and there weren't any birds around? I mean, they didn't sing. Uh, you know, what, what about the guy who was in Alaska when it's not dark for however long and there were no stars around? Okay, I'm not questioning their, their salvation However, the point I'm trying to make is this. When a person trusts Christ, there's no outward visible sign of that initially. There, there's no neon sign that hangs over your head. Born again, born again, born again, born again, born again, born again. But make no doubt about it, his sins were forgiven because the Lord Jesus said that. Now, let's read on and you'll know why we talked about that in just a moment. Verse 6 says, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Can you picture these guys? You talk about the secret service. These scribes, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, they knew every move of the Lord Jesus. And they had somebody there. I mean, they were listening. They were attentively watching every move he made. Anything he would say, they were going to dissect it and examine it word for word. And they're, they're kind of a tangent off to the side of this crowd. And uh, the Bible says they were reasoning in their hearts, which means they were not saying anything audibly. They were just thinking. What were they thinking? The next verse tells us, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin?